Hello, and welcome to the So Emotional Podcast. Here on the cast, we discuss everything emotions through the lens of attachment, the nervous system, and internal parts work. We're a little irreverent and like to have fun exploring the emotional issues and dynamics that interest us. So come along and hang out. Let's explore the fascinating lands of emotions. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the So Emotional Podcast, where we help remove the stigma and enigma around emotions and the emotional mm-hmm. journey. I'm your host, Angela Wetzel, creator of Epic Innator, <laughs> Epic Initiator Coaching. Epic Innator. Epic Innator. <laughs> Actually, people mispronounce my um, Instagram handle because it runs together and they'll be like, is that a pissinator? And I'm like, what is that even? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> this is Nick Carl. Um, he's the creator of the Safe Anchor. He is an experienced somatic experiencer. I'm experiencing in my soma right now, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh. me too. Really hard. Um, so today's topic, um, we actually had a request from the community and it has to do with the uh, immense amount of pressure that young adults are under um towards new sexual adventures sexual pressure um when it comes to like going away to college or even you know Mm -hmm. like i mean this happens probably even in like middle school starting in middle school maybe Mm -hmm. even god hopefully not younger but maybe sometimes you know when children are introduced to sexual things way beyond or way before their understanding and uh development Mm -hmm. of their readiness for it right Um, But specifically when children are away from home for the first time or just, you know, they've got cars and freedom and they're in college and then new social circles, this topic of sexual boundaries and consent and the nervous system is a really important topic. And um, Nick and I actually did record a podcast that we didn't release before, and it was mostly because this topic is very sensitive and there's actually a lot of gray area to it. And um, there's a show on Netflix called um, the anatomy of a scandal. And it, it is actually kind of set up around these like college years of this um, politician. And um, so it kind of opens this like whole can of worms and I don't necessarily agree with the way they like handled the the whole um, series, but it was really just in its first season. But um, based on the request, like the question was um, kind of like there were two parts to it. One is um, there being, let's say there's a couple, there's a girlfriend, boy, um, boyfriend couple, and the boyfriend is pressuring the girlfriend to have sex constantly. And they're just not on the same like schedule. They're just not like always primed to go at the same time. And then, so the boyfriend's like, let's have sex. And she's like, no, I'm really not in the mood. And he's like, come on, come on. He's pressuring, pressuring, pressuring. Finally, she's like, fine, let's get it over with. Right. And then, so it's like, in terms of sexual boundaries and consent, that can seem like a really big gray area. So we want to talk about that. And then also um, the other one just being like friends wanting to um, kind of share their own sexual experience, not necessarily like with a friend, but to say, hey, let's both lose our virginity together. And I'm sure I actually think this has, they've made movies or shows about this where there's like younger um, teenage girls that are like, let's get pregnant together. Let's have our babies together. I'm, I've heard of this kind of thing before. Right. So it's not like entirely unusual for there to be friends that want to have their other friend go through the same sexual experience or initiation at the same time. So there's that kind of like peer pressure as well. Mm-hmm. And then of course, there's just like so many different things when it comes to sex and you know what people get into so let's so get in into the, in the uh so obviously this is like a a made-up scenario we don't know all the details right so we're just going to kind of fill them in with our broad brushes you know but i can imagine because i've been in this place of being in a relationship and being pawing you know pawing right which is just like you know Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Right. And men are usually the ones that are in that like stereotype of, you know, well, and also just having more testosterone. 
usually sure. so, the so initiators. I think, I think about, you know, I think about the constituent parts that are at play or going on when that is happening. And for me, it was like when I was young. So this is like, I can imagine this scenario, like probably like when I'm 20, you know, or like 19. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when I think about boundaries, but really the primary thing that I think about what is happening is the energetic exchange that's happening, like sort of back and forth mm-hmm. ab- about my own personal sort of, I guess it's just desire. I, you know, part of my brain, part of, part of my brain and my being thinks that like getting sex equals like happiness or fulfillment or joy or something, you know, this is tied into my own sort of stuff as like, I felt most real when I was having sex, you know, which is like a strange. Actually, I don't think it's strange at all because if you're, if you're having sex and you're having those feelings of pleasure and you're having like orgasm, like you're most connected in a way to like source energy to that feeling of good like those good feelings those pleasure feelings which is like right it's also like a physical manifestation i think of what something that i was after deeper which is acceptance you know and like you know mm-hmm. being taken in by the big mother or in this case like you know female form like of just like opening up to me which is like something that like i desired but i think what happens is that because i'm disconnected from so many parts of myself and of my own feeling that I actually don't have access to that. And so uh, my pseudo way to get there is to think that my avenue to getting to the best place that I know how to get is mm-hmm. the best place that I know how to get is like actively having sex. And so like, I want to try to be there more often all the time, you know, which so biologically it's like you're winning because you're like in the act of procreating too so there's like so many layers yeah, of winning I mean, that yeah, are going I mean, on i mean this gets into the whole idea of like pseudo intimacy through sexuality right it's like right. you you can take all your clothes off and do all these things and it can it ends up just being an addictive cycle right it is it is an addiction an addiction mm. is not connection right the opposite of, of the opposite of addiction is connection which is, I think, that what I'm actually desiring deeper than that. But without the requisite, um, like, deep training and uh, sort of, like, invitation and uh, connection down into being connected with myself and with those deep parts of myself, I go for the next best thing, which is the best thing that I know how to get, right? But in that energetic exchange with my partner at the time, I think that it leaves a gap, Right. And the gap is that I am stuck in this uh, sort of mode like it's it it ends up being a manipulation. Right. It's like I need to get this thing that is the best way that I know know how to feel. Mm -hmm. And so like when I'm in when I was in proximity, I was just like pawing all the time, just like, you know, trying to like make that happen again, which is like that doesn't feel good because it's not I was not connected to her and the emotions and the actual happenings of what's happening in that moment. I'm out here, I'm like in this system trying to get the, the trying to get the best thing that I know how to get, which is not actually in the moment with what's happening. Because what's happening is, uh, you know, she's not feeling it. She's, she's not connected to me. There isn't actual intimacy happening. So there, there's always mm-hmm. just, just this, this pull. And without really good um without really good connections down into communication or even being able to sort of describe you know because i think that it would be pretty easy to see or to feel or to describe like that she's sort of not interested she's sort of pulling away but you know of course she acquiesces it sometimes just because like you said it's just like you know you just sort of like will be there constantly constantly you're just like okay i guess like you know it's time to do that you know right and it's interesting because in the the other person acquiescing or just being like fine, there's a layer level of self abandonment of right. boundaries. Absolutely. And there's an entire conversation not really being had, which is how do we both get to the same place where right. we want this sexual thing to happen right now? Like right. how do we both get there if we're both willing to get there? Right. You know, are you willing to get there with me? 
and then like crap, I just knock my phone down. But it's like, what is what is the conversation needed? And then in the absence of being able to have that conversation, it's like, how do you set a boundary, right? And part of that, and knowing how to set a boundary actually comes from being able to feel your own feelings, your own limits, right? your own yes or no, or in this case, no. <clears throat> And then you would have to actually follow through with that, with this is what my boundary looks like, this is why, whether or not you need to explain that. And I think the why is really important, right? Because it's like boundary, boundary for what, you know? I think that without, right, it's, without understanding like what you're having the boundary for and why right. that's important, like I don't, I don't think it really makes any sense, but you come to all those things, right? You come to like the understanding of why a boundary is important and why you want to be in connection and in intimacy through, you know, like, that's like, that's like a deep cultivation, right? Yeah. And I, I think it's most important that we know the why for ourselves, even if I don't think we're always necessarily obligated to share that why, but I, but I do think in partnership that the more intimacy you can invite into your relationship, the better. Um, and then there's actually following up your, your why with, um, with action and consequences. So the answer is no. If you keep asking, I will be leaving. If you keep bothering me after that, this is what's going to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a series of very conscious things that need to take place, um, in order for there to be, um, I would say two interdependent people in a relationship rather than codependent people. Right. And because so in a codependent relationship, it's like you said, there's an external goal. It's this thing outside of me is what's going to bring the satisfaction. If they would only do this, I would feel better. Mm -hmm. Or if I could avoid this, I will feel better. Right. Or I want to protect them from the consequences of this behavior. And so it's just people kind of giving their power away, but blaming the other person for it. And then this is where like the whole consent conversation gets very kind of sticky because it's a very delicate, like gray area between understanding consciously um, how much power we do have. And then of course, understanding properly when we've been victimized because it is possible very possible to be victimized just as possible as it is to be victimized but not understanding your own role in your victimization and right. not being able to take responsibility for that and then thus change um, the circumstances that you continually find yourself in and so conversely <laughs> being a perpetrator and not understanding your role in yes. being a perpetrator, right? Through yes, the same unconsciousness. You. Right, you're right. And and that's what I was just about to hit on is that a lot of this, the reason why it's so sticky is because it crosses over into um, subconscious behaviors mm -hmm. and, um, and also our nervous system and certain default settings that we have. And of course, my favorite quote, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Carl Jung. So it's like so much of this is very unconscious and the answer to healing this and creating a healing bridge between people, because I personally believe that um, most people have good intentions and are kind at heart, mm -hmm. um, but they carry a lot of emotional trauma <clears throat> or just a lot of unconscious behaviors that are carried mm -hmm from like generations before mm -hmm. um, and certain ways of being. And so it is possible for people to be perpetrators and continuing cycles of abuse that they lack awareness around. And it's just as possible that people fall into victim roles that um, it's also the same where um, just based on generational um, like behavioral patterns that they've adopted as well, that they, their nervous system has chosen more of that, of the, the victim mm -hmm. and not really having awareness around that as well. So it's right. this whole thing is um, bringing consciousness to it allows us to um, reclaim our power 
and also um, heal the adversarial relationship that we have with others. And I think that's possible when we really um, do our best to take as much responsibility as we can, even as that may be extremely uncomfortable um, to admit that we've had a part in our own victimization or understanding that we've abandoned ourselves mm-hmm. in, in a moment where we really needed to set boundaries and we just weren't able to. Right. <clears throat> no, the, the, I, th- I don't know if we, have we had a podcast? Did we have a podcast about personal power and victimization? I think we did. Yeah, we did. We sure. did. So, um, you know, so I th- go b- going back to the scenario that I think about, which kind of mirrors like the relationship that I actually had. It's like uh, pawing, right? I can imagine that she doesn't want to hold a strong boundary because then that leads to uh, sort of like an abandonment wound. So like there yeah. is there is a sense of, uh, what is the type of... Well, maybe it's like if <laughs> like I it's don't... A, it's an anxious attachment. It's a codependency. So by not holding up her own boundary and saying that like, I don't, I don't appreciate, I don't like this. This doesn't, this doesn't like... St- jive with the things that i believe but i will sort of put up with it because the in the the bigger equation you leaving is a bigger problem than me abandoning myself right which is the sort of mesh point for the power right for your own personal power right that taking that responsibility for holding your own boundaries is is where that is at and then Conversely, sort of like in my role, it's being sort of like selfish or a little bit narcissistic and, and but also not understanding that, you know, just uh, abandoning my own responsibility towards others and myself in gaining what I think is the, the big golden carrot in the sky, right, which is like sex, which is like, you know, trying to use manipulation or just persistency to like get a thing that I want, you know is again like uh right. i think uh it's a it's an abandoning i don't know well the way i see it it's like um an unconscious kind of people pleasing like you said if i say yes now or i just say yes to this it's not a big deal maybe it is maybe it isn't right. then this person won't, won't leave me mm-hmm so it's, you know, it's like if I keep saying no or whatever, but it's like, you know, again, there's no conversation being had, but also it's like, there's no internal conversation being had. Like there's no awareness into what's really going on likely with either I mean, person. I mean, that I just know personally, this just goes back to the, the first time we tried to record this podcast, you know, you sort of like ask, but I have, right. I have a relationship with pleasing right and being mm-hmm. you know an affable nice person nice guy you know and uh yeah. about like oh yeah well, you know yeah we can do that and then <laughs> it's just funny mm-hmm. that the it kicks up a whole like internal internal uh discussion between my personal parts of like of not wanting to do something and then energy can start to really come out sideways cuz when I do abandon myself, like it doesn't like <laughs> my system now, like it doesn't like everybody is not in their place. It creates sort of like an internal uproar, you know, I don't know. Yeah, it was, um, it was kind of ironic that our podcast about consent actually covered the unconscious topic of consent, which is if a person does have people pleasing, and I think, honestly, most people do. I I think every, I think everyone does just because, you know, like we're social creatures, we have social contract, like we want to stay Mm -hmm. in, in our tribes. Like we, we don't want to be ostracized or end up alone or abandoned Mm because that can mean death. Right. So it's, it's interesting how, um, under the radar these things can be. And, um, yeah, it's like saying yes to something, uh, that you might feel that um, constriction or just that feeling of discomfort. And maybe the um, the thing that we're used to is bypassing that and just being like, oh, it's not a big deal, only to find out that it actually is a big deal and that there's there's things that 
we need to express or share mm. about our fears or what our own personal limitations are in that moment so that like in a way we're having our hand held like through something or just to like like have those parts be heard um to even find out whether or not this is like the right moment for this like is it really a yes is it a no like mm -hmm. and why you know what i mean so right. again it's like really about intimacy and being able to have these conversations but the the courage to be vulnerable to share what your limitations are and risk um rejection in a way for having your own boundaries yeah. which can be really really scary to the anxious attachment style the person that has anxious attachment and i know that you know like in our disagreement about or just the disharmony and trying to film the the previous episode you know it's just there's a circuitous route uh until like there is some sort of like understanding about like what's actually happening you know so i think that unfortunately there can be a lot of confusion around you know the own upheavals mm -hmm. that you have inside when it comes to your own your own boundaries not being um or your own abandonment and then like how that how that then manifests inside your own being you know right um it's interesting because if you consider like ours was just a conversation like a mm -hmm. couple conversations leading up to recording mm -hmm. but that was with both of us being like not under the influence of alcohol like not being in the same right. proximity together <laughs> they're not being like a rage of hormones like in right. a party with there's like loud you know there's just like when um a lot uh, when i think about these um things that happen mm. like ki the kinds of settings and the kinds of circumstances under which they happen it's usually with um, people having their, um, what's the word? Um, like using alcohol or drugs. So they're, um, they're impaired, you know, they're under the influence of something which is changing their um, entire like physiology and perspective and ability to even like speak up or understand right. what's going on or impulse control. So there's just a lot of different subconscious things that are now coming to the surface. Right. Um, so there's that, like the, you know, influence of drugs, alcohol, there's, um, peer, there's different peer pressure things yeah. happening. There's, um, sometimes like loud music and darkness and just like a lot of confusion. I mean, like so we're talking, it, it makes me think about the idea of external stimuli it's like what are the best things in the world right it's like lamborghinis and millions of dollars you know and and sex you know it's like it's like these information streams are like hierarchies of value right sex is way up there it's this it's this big like sort of like mythical thing that's it's like good you know and part of the like you know the zeitgeist now is like you know oh no, yeah not just in your belt like anything you can get you know is like you know mm -hmm. is 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 uh you know is like booty and gold and uh you know things to collect you know yeah. uh which is it just goes on with this idea that that like yes if you get the lamborghinis if you get all the sex if you get all the things you okay <laughs> but if you get all the things if you get all the external things right you get all the sex if you push all the buttons do all the manipulations that that is what's going to like check the box into fulfillment right then you're going to be yeah. fulfilled then you're living a good life right which i think is part of the big lie and that comes from that comes from society right it, big time from society it, like it comes in all these Boobies. different informations all yes yeah. all these things so and what's sort of been practiced for so long but the you know i think that the the rub or like the uh it, what I, I think it ends up being a lie, right? What's where the real gold is is an actual intimacy and connection is being connected to people, right. and so it's you know you put young people together, like bathed in all this information and all this habituation of 
this is how this is how you feel good and this is how you live and this is how you know you're living good is by doing like practicing these behaviors and doing these things and looking a certain way and that's what good life is right right but to do that then you have to participate in all these abandonments all these sort of like porous things into these places of victimization and perpetration and uh, like power struggles and ma- manipulations right that it, it becomes all of those things so you have like all this side sort of detritus and pain and uh like disconnection that happens in the exercise of what this what is supposed to be the good things about life right sex so drugs and rock and roll external pursuit as opposed to like the real thing that we actually all want the real thing that we actually all want that most of us don't know really anything about or about how to get there or or about how to practice that and so um i just know like it's not even until very like recently in the last like five six years that like of being exposed and beginning just beginning to have an understanding of this uh, of this realm, of the emotional realm, of the realm of the heart, of the realm of the spirit, of the realm of power and then creativity, right? So mm-hmm. I think about that, like, I think about two people coming together who actually have good boundaries and that what that begins to look like. And then, you know, if you follow the energy in creativity and in love and in respect, then I think naturally between human beings, then you can follow those impulses into sexual places and have it be really s- sort of like life-giving for people that mm-hmm. you can you can s- s- be met and be seen and be held and have those experiences as well. You know, but when we're oriented towards <clears throat> just checking the boxes, right? I did the thing, now I should feel good, right? Which right. is like, oh, I got the billion dollars. I won the lottery. Shouldn't I? Shouldn't my heart now feel good? Shouldn't my insides now feel good? Am I not a whole person now? And the answer is no, 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 right. no, no. It can be addictive because it's powerful. Like sex addiction is a real thing, you know. It's like you can just have a ton of sex to like get you by and get you through your days, you know. But it's not. It's not at to the heart of the matter, you know. Right. <clears throat> I was thinking of something and then it left my brain. Oh no. I know. Um I was gonna say something no, I don't remember. That's wrong. But I was thinking about the show, the state of no, what is it? Mm. The anatomy of a scandal. Right. So is politicians involved? Yeah, right. Yeah. So and who else is this involved? Is like, what are the characters? Uh, like lawyers, like um, okay, lawyers. It's like the high court in the UK, something okay. like that. Sure. But so it it is interesting because it does go back to this like college experience, um, and it kind of shows that this one politician. So he's married, mm-hmm. and uh, to. I, for, I don't remember the actor's name, but he's married to Sienna Miller's character. And the guy isn't like a serial rapist or anything, but it was made. Oh, yeah. So when you were talking about how there's like all this feedback from society and like how essentially like men and women should be or like what the goals are. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like oftentimes men are tasked with like the initiation of relationship pursuit and sex. But I mean, Mm -hmm. those are like stereotypes, of course, making the moves, making the moves, right? Men are the gas pedal. Women are the brakes. Right. Right. Which is right. Interesting. Um, and that kind of, uh, like dispouses responsibility for each person to be both for themselves. Mm. Right. Sure. Or yeah. espouse, whatever that word is. Espouse. espouse, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sometimes I say the wrong things. Um, but the other thing I was going to say is, yeah, oh, this is what I was going to say, and then I'll go back to the thing I was saying. Um, so the other thing that we can forget is like boundaries and consent is like a moment by moment thing, 
that we mm. need to be like aware of. So you can say yes to a sexual act and be midway and say, no, something doesn't feel right. Like we need to stop. Right. Mm. So it's like remembering that you can always revoke your consent and then change. And then if two people have that kind of mutual respect and have that kind of compassion and kindness, like in that present moment, then you should be able to pivot in that like moment because right. you're, you're there like in connection with mm -hmm. each other. There's real intimacy. There's real, like, I care about you as a human. I don't care about some outcome or some projected like future mm -hmm. place or finishing. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't care about the finish line. I care about you being in this moment with me mm -hmm. that we're both agreeing to it and both good, happy. Right. So it's interesting because in this um, show, which I feel like is important that they broached the topic, I feel like they avoided giving um, like an answer, like a real clear answer on like what they thought or like what their own narrative was around it. And I get it. Um, but the, the situation is, is he as a politician, as a certain type is like this go-getter. And so he's like an attractive, um, like popular guy in college. And he is more of the type. And of course there was alcohol involved for him and the other girl. And it was like a chance meeting in the dark. I think it took place in under like five minutes. And I wanted to pivot into talking about the nervous system and how tricky things can get when it comes to consent, because you also have to consider that in these interpersonal circumstances that your nervous system, if there's a threat that's detected, your nervous system is going to decide for you what the best course of action is, mm -hmm. which can be fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Right. Which is like how you stay safe. So what we were witnessing when they go back to this um, purported rape scene was that he was doing the, you know, the initiating thing, like the, what did you say, being the gas pedal right not super aware like and she freezes and isn't able to say and there's a point where she dissociates you can see it mm. she just goes somewhere else and she's not able to say no or to say she's not comfortable he's not in the moment registering that and she's not able to she's traumatized by the situation to mm. him it's like nothing right because he's just like in the zone doing his thing, but this has altered her entire life. Right. And but it it's can a, be it's really... A prime, but it's a prime example of not... It's yeah. acting in a disconnected state, right? Like with right. Goal, and... goals in mind, in his mind, and in her mind, which is in like a traumatized, yeah. sympathetic or parasympathetic like lockdown. She's, mm -hmm. having, she's, having, she's, ha she's having a survival response which right. in this case is to freeze. And right. because she freezes and it doesn't then communicate, like she's not screaming and trying to run away. She right, and she's not saying no and she's not saying stop. Like her body is shut down and yet he has, uh, he's still mm. on his goal thing. And so here we are in this like, victim and a perpetrator role. And, yeah. you know, and which is a highly unconscious like interaction, you know? Yeah. Right. And also for the person that is in that freeze mode, like utterly horrific, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because they're not able to respond. And so it's just, it's interesting the divide, how one person can have a recollection or experience of a moment because he's in his own world mm -hmm. and the woman being in her own world, like how different those two worlds are when there's no um, there's no connection or attunement to what's really happening. Right. And if you look at a lot of these <clears throat> gray area situations, like a lot of things that came out around the Me Too movement, um, there was an article in the Huntington Post written about Aziz Ansari that almost ended his career, where there was a woman, they, they went on a date, they went back to his apartment, 
and I think, and it sounded similar where she had a freeze response too, where they were making out and he was doing stuff to her and she was like, not able to say no, but she kept going along with it. Right. And then she wrote into Huntington Post to say he was awful. Like he didn't care about me. He wasn't, right. you know, but again, it's almost like the same kind of situation. And then you and I were watching <clears throat> that Louis C.K. <laughs> um, comedy special. <clears throat> Sorry. And he was talking about like really what happened and his advice that he gave was, and to me, again, it sounds like the same thing where it's people not checking in with each other and really mm -hmm. listening and really observing and being mm -hmm. present. And he said, whenever you go into a room of people or whatever and he says and you ask them if you can jerk off in front of them and they say yes he said make sure you follow that with are you sure right which is funny but it's not funny because yeah. in his mind he's checked the box of asking the question what's happening over here with these people that he's he's asked because i think there were a couple people in the room mm -hmm. um they're probably like, he's a comedian, like, ha, ha, ha. Like, who knows? Like, maybe they were all like several drinks in, like, right. we don't know the full circumstances, mm -hmm. but they're like, sure, we don't care or yes. And it's like, um, you know, then he proceeds and then there's like an, you know, an upset there. There's like right. a boundary that's been crossed without there's a disconnection. Real, yeah. There's a, a, another disconnection. Right. So it's just interesting to see the patterns of disconnection and the kind of, um, you know, havoc that's, that's mm -hmm. being. So <laughs> it just makes me think about some of the basics that's happening, right? So we've described a couple of scenarios where people didn't know each other very well. Okay. And what happens when you don't know each other very well are subtle signals about what's happening inside. Well, first off, I just want to say that like you start to understand, uh, which I had this, I had a realization around this uh, not very long ago. I'd seen it because I only get glimpses, and that is about how quickly moments happen, mm -hmm. right? About how many moments there are. Yeah. There's a lot. And like, how fast does it go? Well, it's like every second, every half a second, you know? Probably Moments faster. are like a... a <laughs> are a bullet train coming at you, right? Now, we, I don't think as human beings that we can sit there and like, you know, like uh, go through each one, like what's happening this moment? Okay, we'll do this next moment. Okay, well, let's do this. Like it's a continuum. It's, it's a flow past our nervous systems, you know, and our consciousness. So we have all these canned responses, right? Because that's just how we are as human beings. We're just like a set of canned responses, which ends up being most of our personality. And this gets into some of the dynamics that, that I sort of seen uh, that like me as a being, as a personality, like you just put the quarter in me in the morning and then like, you know, I have a hundred canned responses to like different situations and they, they just come out. They just happen because they're practiced. That's who I am, you know, but right. to be sensitive enough to notice the subtleness of energy in the moment takes practice to like learn learn about that like i you, know, right. you can start to see this like when you walk into a room and it's like what's the vibe in here right it's that type of stuff right it's like how right. are these people acting like what's really happening here this there's it's a subtle energetic thing and when you meet somebody new like it's a whole new ball game right it, it takes mm -hmm. time to understand like what are their uh, mean deviations in how their personality interacts you know and their personality is like bouncing off there's some scars they're bouncing off their trauma really you know it's bouncing off mm -hmm. the, the stimuli they're getting from moment to moment um and then you okay let's say you practice you just go hang out with somebody for an hour every day maybe it takes a few months until you sort of like start to understand them and you you put them in a box just because we all do that like we sort of construct a way that we know them and then to add alcohol to that right <laughs> <laughs> to add like some sort of okay. like uh, consciousness bending thing, it just becomes very tricky, you know? So like not knowing people, right? Not having like a baseline for how to like show up for them and to be, so, you know, that's unconscious right away. Uh, and then throwing in substances, which like 
can tr yeah. trick it up really well. So you think about like, okay, if we're if we're if we're not gonna if we're not gonna be disconnected and we're not gonna be unconscious. So well, then, what what do you have to do? Like, what do, what do you have to pay attention to? And it's like, holy shit! It's like thousands of moments every day, and mm -hmm. the, and there are bouncing off of hidden things inside of people, you know, bouncing off hidden things inside of yourself, you know, like the dance yeah. happens very quickly, and right. you, even with a ton of like effort and consciousness it is hard to begin to come into a relationship with those things you know intimacy is actually i think kind of difficult you can come into a dance you know uh but just just to say that uh, there's a whole realm of happenings that i think is glossed over really well it's interesting because the mastery there is to be fully in your experience while registering the external experience as mm. best as you can right but it doesn't mean that you simply observe and then make interpretations or assumptions about what's happening that you actually register what you're seeing and then ask right i'm yeah. noticing this like it, it makes me think of um when i was at atlantic acting school um but this was a meisner technique i'm pretty sure that we did and i forget what the name of it is but it's literally like two people standing face to face, like just how you and I are kind of, and it's like, I would be like, you're listening intently. And then you would say you're entertained. Like you would like look at my expression and then mm. you observing my expression. Yeah. So this is energetic Marco Polo. Yes, exactly. So we, you know, we were doing that in acting school because acting is about the moment. It's about the moment to moment mm. changes. So it's really interesting that what I was being taught in acting school, I mean, I, I stumbled onto like my deep traumas because I went to acting school. Mm -hmm. And some of the things they were teaching us it was really to um, destructure um, some of these held trauma patterns in our bodies through mm -hmm. neurogenic tremoring which was um, at that time, the Fitzmorris technique. Um, now that's one uh, version of it. There's also trauma, trauma releasing exercises by Dr. David Berselli, hmm. neurogenic tremoring. So I actually did neurogenic tremoring for like two years in my acting studio. Hmm. I did like deep trauma release, like um, observing my own perspectives through script analysis, hmm. like, moment to moment practice like learning intimacy like all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. um which was really really fascinating and i wasn't i did not expect that but um it, it is it's fascinating just to um just to realize like the the mastery that it takes like the mm -hmm. you being able to know yourself to know when you're triggered to kind of know your, um, to like map your own triggers, to kind of know what sort of behaviors you might go to when you're triggered or when you're avoiding certain emotions. Hmm. Um, and there was something else I wanted to say based on what you were saying, but I've also forgotten. <laughs> um, you know, like I didn't go to, to acting school or do any uh, body-based trauma, well, trauma work, but one of the things that I've just noticed of hanging out with myself more, like just paying attention to what I do, is how um, disassociated I become. And so when I think about that, it's like it's essentially just going into my head and having daydreams is one way to put it, right? So a place that I go is into just some thought structure away from my being. So it's like mm -hmm. my mind's eye leaves my eyes where they are here now, right? And goes mm -hmm. into a daydream. And that was my go-to, right? And then it's happening all the time, even in stuff like sex, you know, but in, in relationship, it's like part of my being is always living out here outside of, like outside of my body in just some thought world, you know, which is, uh, it's just, it's part of what I practice now, which is to, when, when it happens, you know, just be like, oh, I was out of my body again. I was having a, like another thought into outer space again. And then just come here, like feel my body, right? Say that it's okay to be here. It's okay to stay safe, uh, which is, I mean, 
it's tough, but it's just like over and over, like bringing my consciousness back and say, it's like, it's, it's okay. Here is where the action is, right? Here is where reality is. Here is where we can be creative right here. Not, mm -hmm. I mean, I can have creative thoughts and that's good. Like I, you know, I don't want to like, like I don't write off my mind or my imagination to say that it's, uh, you know, like a bad thing because I don't think that it is because because I can I can be creative in those places too but to run to that go to place to buffer myself away from myself you know is something that I that's a like personally like one of the things that I work with and try to bring more connection around so that I can cultivate being in the moment and then reacting in the moment and not going into like a practiced you know practice trauma response which is still very tough and like we tried to record this before total trauma trauma bomb just just like you know like right. spin out and it took a while and, you know and when i get fired up sometimes it does take me a while to come come back like i mm -hmm. I, I will spin out for a days a week maybe weeks maybe months like i get a little frustrated sometimes for sure i think that one was only a week yeah, I mean, but you um, you were mentioning earlier about um, how you feel like your upbringing like kind of predisposed you to having a distorted relationship with consent. Yeah, I, I think that there was a big time fight that was always happening all the time, which I think unfortunately was so profound that it's still tough to get around which plays into kind of the nice guy scenario. You know, it's like, you just have to be, I just have to be sort of like consenting and like there and present, especially with like a female mother energy type stuff. Right. Because mm -hmm. part of my being is, is so desperately wants my mother to like, see me as the radiant, beautiful gift that I am and take pleasure in me. Right. I want that so badly, right, that it gets, uh, like, superimposed onto, like, the, the bigger world and onto women in general, right? It's like there's, like, a puppy dog inside me. It's like, please pet me. Please, please love me, you know? And uh, it's very tricky, right? Because, like, I will then abandon. I won't have, like, a boundary. I won't check in with, do, like, it's like, do I actually want to do that? Is that... Is that, do I have any, is, is it any fun there? Or is it just this other thing that is like still bleeding out in the night in the unconscious until you make the conscious conscious, you will, what? It What's, will direct your life. So it's directing my life, right? Mm. And I'm calling it fate, right? But that's, uh, so I don't know. That's one of my, one of my big, like, you know, I would say probably the, the number one because it keeps coming back over and over and over and over looking for some sort of expression or looking to be tended to right and mm -hmm. i can see it like i'm i'm sort of like backwards engineering it and i can see how it if you know i can feel all the ways that it affects me i can see all the way that it sort of like pushes me around or leads me by the nose or just brings me back to this certain point of view but still i have i haven't been able to directly uh you know meet this part or to say that you know we have autonomy or we have creativity here that we can do something for this you know so i don't know it's tough yeah the other thing you know it's interesting because i i married a yes man but i didn't realize it mm -hmm. and so he would just say yes to a lot of things and then what I was really wanting was like a sounding board. Like I was wanting someone to talk to and be like, is this a good idea? Is this a good idea for us both? Like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and at the time, like I was completely unconscious too. So I'm like, that energy was very like reflective, I'm sure as well. And then the, um, the kind of betrayal that I felt from that situation because he, I found out he was just saying yes and that he really didn't want to do those things. Like mm. it felt really awful to me mm -hmm. to be like, 
it's kind of like, oh, that wasn't good for you too. Like you just said yes, you know? And it's like the realization that it's like, maybe I got something I wanted, but you, it wasn't genuine for you to give me that or say yes. So I'm over here in this experience, like thinking that it's okay for you, but you have like, to me, I was like, that felt like such a huge betrayal. And in a way it was like, I know that he built up a lot of resentment over it and viewed me as the perpetrator in that situation. Mm -hmm. But on the other end of that, like I felt very victimized by his saying yes and not really being honest with me. And then I was like, our entire relationship is, is based on a lie. It's based on you just trying to please me Right. which means you're self-abandoning, which means now you resent me and hate me. Right. And then it just ends up in these like blurred lines of like, um, well, an adversarial relationship, mm-hmm. right? It's like giving our power away, but being angry at the other person or blaming right. them for our own lack of boundaries, our own lack of awareness, our own right. lack of consent. Um and it's like those lines between like perpetrator and victim, especially in those, in, in a lot of areas are, you know, they're very gray because yeah. to each person, if they're the one in the moment being like, oh, I think you want this and you're kind of there, not what, well, whatever's happening, likely it's not very conscious. Right. Um, then it's like, well, what the fuck was that? Right. Right. So it's like, depending on the person and the perspective, right. you'll have your perpetrator and victim. Mm-hmm. And I think that that like speaks that we actually do want connection and like some part of our being like, it like knows what that feels like. There's a resonance there and there's also sort of like the win-win or that we went through that together and that then there's the byproduct of trust, right? It's like, I can trust mm-hmm. you to be you, right? And then to like interact with me and then there, there's some there's some kind of resonance there or goodness that is born out of that right but then but if you know but if the vectors are off you know and then you know in this case like you finally came to that realization you saw that the vectors are off enough pieces of the puzzle like came together and you're like oh oh this is what's happening you know and that's a that's right. got, when that does happen it's a big letdown it's just like oh, what the fuck are we doing you know it's like what right. is happening and that's that right. kind of that kind of dissonance is <laughs> it's hard to come back from but like you know i uh, you know i've been in enough relationships that that type <laughs> crossing those rubicons of fear because there there is a lot of fear in vulnerability you know is pretty tough and i know that like there's there was i can remember specific times when i like pulled back like i couldn't go there you know because i just didn't have enough internal trust or understand that that's where the gold actually lies in like opening up, like actually sharing who I actually am, right? Mm-hmm. That that that's where that's where realness is, instead of like employing all these strategies and th- these abandonments that I probably couldn't even see at the time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's kind of like you know, what this podcast is about is like entering into that emotional journey with ourselves so that we can be attuned to ourselves and really know ourselves and understand how we feel Mm -hmm. and express that with other people. Because if we don't have that, there's absolutely no way to be present or be in an actual relationship. Mm -hmm. Like there is no way to like fully relate if you don't understand like your own experience first Mm -hmm. and like share that and then become curious about other people and um I don't know why my brain keeps going back to this like (laughs) this like what I genuine genuinely believe that people are like good and when we're having an experience like I honestly don't want something if it means that it puts another person out, like I won't be able to, like, I want someone to be there with me in like the goodness. Mm. If I have to gain because someone else is suffering massively, I'm like, don't do it. 
please. Right. Yeah. Like there's another way, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that most people are like that. And of course, you know, we're excluding like some of the sociopaths. I do think there are people out there. 3% to... of the population. Right. So you have to consider that at least 3% of the population is not going to fit into these norms or mores. Right. Like it's just, it's not going to happen, but you can safely bet that about 97% of people will actually give a shit. And even um, in um, Dr. Richard Schwartz, um, his latest book, No Bad Parts, and this was the point I wanted to come back to, is, um, and I wanted to read that, um, Mastin Kip had a quote in his book that I wanted to talk about too. I have to get my phone off the floor though. Oh. Um, I dropped it earlier, but uh. so he taught, the, the book is called No Bad Parts because he talks about an internal family systems really like he went to a um it was like a facility i think somewhere in um illinois for sex offenders hmm. and he, and i think also murders like he had worked with a really difficult you know considered like high risk difficult population mm -hmm. and he said in getting to know those those parts it's like when the abuse was happening to them they actually um a, an aspect of their personality took on the role of the perpetrator to protect them, hmm. to like protect them from what was happening to them. But it's almost this like transference or introjection of the abuse. Like it, it comes firmly into a person. So what I've seen in the, the cycles of abuse is that a person will either reject or emulate the abuser like they'll make a decision i never want to feel that powerless again or i never want to do that to another person mm. so based on your orientation to the abuse that happened to you or how your nervous system adapts or how your your parts adapt will um will reflect your predisposition to how you react so when there's trauma that occurs i believe that everyone holds both ends of the stick we mm -hmm. hold the potential for perpetration and we hold the potential for victimization, right? Right. Especially <clears throat> until we heal that we kind of carry like the imprint, right. the experience of the energy of the abuser and the experience of being abused, mm. which is why like I will from time to time, like on Instagram, <clears throat> I will talk about how, um, abusers like will unconsciously um like until they're aware of the abuse like they'll unconsciously abuse right and then mm -hmm. i'll have people it never fails truly hasn't failed yet someone will either dm me or they'll write on there like after all my years of healing and doing this i've come to find out or i like abuse is always a choice but then we get into that gray area of kind of consent in a way it's like a choice so that means that a person is fully consciously online and choosing to abuse to hurt to victimize another person i would say the part that is victimizing or abusing another person is mostly unconscious or sure. in the subconscious realm mm -hmm. i believe that just because of generational abuse, um, people are products of their own environment. Now, what I'm not saying, I'm not saying that people don't have responsibility for their actions or that they shouldn't have consequences for their behaviors. Sure. So absolutely, I'm saying that while abuse may not be a fully conscious choice, unfortunately, as an adult or even as children, like there are consequences. Like we don't just let people have bad behavior or abuse and just be like yeah it's mm -hmm. fine it's not your fault whatever it's like right. it may have not been your fault that you were abused um you may not have full conscious awareness of your own behaviors and abuse cycle but you are responsible for the um the hurt and the abuse and the pain that you cause other yeah. people especially in society and i and it is up to each individual person both as the person that's feeling victimized, I believe they have a responsibility to themselves to say no, to get out of there as best they can. But like these things can be really hard to extricate yourself from. 
Right. You know, like like the battered woman who's got children who's like, I don't know how to support myself outside of this. Mm-hmm. It happens, you know, not super often, but often enough, you know. And so there's just like a lot of circumstances there in it. But it's like each person has a responsibility to share their own internal experience, but also their own boundaries, and then to follow through on those boundaries and consequences. If you touch me again, I'll be calling the police or I will be removing myself and the children and calling the police or doing, you know, whatever I need to do to protect myself. Sure. Um, And sometimes it's not always the best to explain all of that, especially if you have a person who is extremely unstable. You don't necessarily want to tell them. It just depends, right? So it can be really um, tricky, but... I guess my point is, is um, it's a lot more unconscious and it takes a person deciding that they want responsibility. It takes awareness first. So a person that's abusing needs to be aware that it's actually abuse. Right. They might have normalized it because there's at least like, I think 31 different psychological defense mechanisms that they've identified And just a small handful of those should give you an insight into what the the brain does in order to keep us safe. Minimization, denial, projection, um, Mm -hmm. identification. I don't know if I'm going to repeat these. So uh, like transference. There's a number of things that the nervous system does to compartmentalize what's happened to make it seem less than to deny that it happened to project it onto another person to overlay it to make it someone else's responsibility so it's basically um our own system of like titrating what we're able to metabolize emotionally at that time which means that it's going to take those experiences and if need be, it will cause like dissociation, meaning you cut off and numb from yourself. Like you separate from your body, your emotions. So you don't feel the trauma or the abuse that's happening. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of the psychological defense mechanisms keep us from feeling or being able to fully experience what's happening in our bodies because we don't yet have the tools or the resources or the support Mm-hmm. to be able to understand those things. Right. So it makes sense. So if you're behind all these doors of all these psychological um, protective mechanisms, all these things, your perspective from those places can be, I would say, distorted from reality. And this is where the idea of therapy and coaching comes in. It's it's uh, like a grounded, safe place to help you, lead you back into a different experience and a different perspective of yourself. And when you can begin to get those, like you can have aha moments or you can see connections that you previously couldn't see that you know were, were kept at arm's length or were kept at bay just to keep you in this safe pattern that your your body and your brain sort of like figured out how to do, right? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, I don't think I went back and finished the thing I was saying about no bad parts, but um, what Dr. Schwartz is saying in that book is that he never met a part he didn't like. Because he Mm. said, after all the protections and understanding, like each of those parts had a specific job, like a reason for reenacting that abuse and doing is like that part is like trapped or frozen in the past. And it's kind of like this groundhog's day of hell Mm -hmm. where they keep reenacting the same thing, which is like, you know, repetition compulsion, like trying to free yourself from this prison by um, committing the same crime. Yeah. and 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 it's not, it's not like what they're doing is a good thing but in the context of how they understood the right. world those parts even though they're you know we'll say bad uh made sense like they were doing a job that they were tasked right. to do to, in, a, in the world that they understood right yeah like trying to protect the individual so those parts were always ultimately protective right of the individual even as they were perpetrating and once they had those burdens relieved they had no need to um, do the same thing again. Right. Yep. So it, I, I just, um, I wanted to say that, but I also wanted to read 
the quote. <laughs> I'm getting my phone off the floor. Okay, so it's a couple pages. Um, okay, so this is from Mastin Kipp's book, Claim Your Power. Okay. And it says, um, okay, so he says, purpose, you might think it's simply a matter of creating a new behavioral pattern. Want to stop being an alcoholic? Easy, just stop drinking. Want to lose weight? Simple, just stop eating sugar and carbs and work out more often. Want to make more money? Simple, just visualize it. Want to fall in love and live happily ever after? Simple, just pick someone who is needy and relies on you more than you rely on them. Just kidding about the last one, but only slightly. It's an oversimplification to say that we can change our lives on the level of behavior. What's more, it's a sentiment that truly lacks compassion or true understanding for the human condition. We see this in mass every January 1st at gyms across the world. Well, more like January 5th because it takes a few days to recover from the holidays. That's when a whole bunch of people sign up for new gym memberships. Why does this happen? Are people not disciplined enough? Do they not want it enough? Are they just lazy? That's not what I found. What I found is that people genuinely want to better their lives, but they don't have a proper map showing them the way and they don't know what they're up against. They don't understand that in trying to better their lives, they're going up against a lifetime of behaviors, stories, emotions, and beliefs. Not only that, they're going up against the rules and value system of their current peer, peer groups. Without the proper mindset and determination, they're destined to fail. It's the same with our lives. We can create a never ending cycle of guilt, shame, and regret, not knowing what is keeping us stuck. Right. So I think about taking that back to our original scenario or like this, you know, uh, pawing boyfriend and this, you know, that here they are a wash, you know, what do they want? She wants like to have like a good relationship or have a good boyfriend, you know? But they're awash in all of this, uh, like, information, all of this habituated things that they sort of, uh, you know. So they get themselves into this situation, you know. It's like, here we are at the gym, or here we are in this relationship, and this, shouldn't it just be good? And it's just like, there are, there's a whole other, I always call it sort of the hidden realm of emotions and how emotions work and how your inner parts work, you know, that needs mm -hmm. to come into consciousness and brought into, brought into a, like, a healthy moment by moment like uh recognizing and consciousness and, and flow with to begin to live uh in these ways that we're capable of living i think yeah i'd agree with that and just to like make sure that we kind of covered the original question i would say that the answer really lies with knowing what you're comfortable with and not mm. and then really feeling into that. And it might be possible for you to say, I don't have an answer right now. It doesn't feel comfortable for me at this moment. Let me think about it. Mm -hmm. Or I really don't like that. I don't want to do that. Like, you know, yeah. um, but I would say but, the message that you, you, it's very important to pay attention to how you feel, right? Yeah. Like it's really important. You're a really important person in the, in the equation, like you right. being you and you being happy with what's happening is extremely important. Right. Yeah. I like that you said that it's like you matter, you mm. matter, how you feel matters mm. and it must matter the most to you. Right. It must matter the most to you because no one is going to advocate for your feelings and boundaries and no one can know your inner world as much as you do. Right. So it is of vital importance that you care about how you feel yeah. and that you share those things. And if you don't know how you feel yet, that's okay. Yeah, like just you're curious. entitled. Yeah. Just be curious. You're entitled to take your time. You're entitled to say no. Mm -hmm. And if you feel uncomfortable with something and you don't want to do it, you say no. And if you need help around that, like I definitely recommend finding a counselor or, you know, I know on college campuses, for example, that they do have counselors available, um, that you get support maybe from your own therapist or you hire a coach or whatever, mm -hmm. um, in being able to <clears throat> not just feel your feelings, but express your boundaries and know how to feel safe and stand up for yourself, but also consider, um, 
being a really like a really good parent or a really good friend to yourself. So <clears throat> if you know that when you drink, you kind of lose your impulses, your um, your protective impulses and do things that you regret, really consider that your inner children like need your adult self, like needs your adult self to be sober in order to protect those younger inner parts. Hmm. So try to think of yourself as like mother, father, and child that you have like this holy trinity inside of you and listen to and be an advocate for your own inner children and those parts of you that are like, I'm scared, I'm not sure, I don't know what to do. Those younger parts of you need you to connect with your higher self and your adult self that's present now and to advocate and share what those boundaries are and to follow through with them. So you have little baby cubs, so you also must be fierce mama tiger and fierce <laughs> daddy bear. <laughs> like you have to be, um, you need to stand up for yourself and yeah. share and advocate yeah. for yourself as much as you can advocate for yourself. Definitely. So, um, yeah. And I understand that it can be scary because sometimes expressing those boundaries or saying yes or no can mean the loss of relationships, mm -hmm. but better to lose a person that isn't willing to attune to you or value your, um, your no, your yes. Um, better to lose them than to abandon yourself yeah. and and deal with the repercussions and yeah. shame of of that which can feel right. really awful yeah because you'll be taking on a bunch of damage essentially you'll be abandoning yourself and damaging yourself just to you know keep somebody who's bad for you around like it can be a real double whammy so yeah and they're just pretty much treating you or reflecting back to you the way you're treating yourself right oof, oof. um but you know yeah, like hard, you know, hard lessons learned. Like I've learned those lessons myself. Sexual boundaries, <laughs> consent, the nervous system. So emotional. <laughs> I got to pee so bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I do too, so it's good. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Leave a comment. Um, thank you for listening. We'd love to hear your feedback and if thank this you, is Angela. helpful. All right. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.